Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the October 18th webinar of the 2DCC. Today we have a special guest, Scott Crooker, from the National High Magnetic Field Lab, um, located at Los Alamos National Lab. Scott, please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thank you all for uh, coming to this seminar or this, this, this webinar. Uh, as, as, as mentioned, I'm visiting here today from the very small part of the National High Magnetic Field Lab that's located not in Florida, but actually located up in the high mountains of northern New Mexico at Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. And our main focus at Los Alamos National Lab is to design, build, use the world's most powerful magnets. And what that means is pulse magnets and pulse magnetic fields with uh, field scales, you know, up to and even exceeding 100 Tesla. And in the last several years, our optical spectroscopy group at the Magnet Lab has been using these uh, very powerful magnetic fields to look at uh, some of the optical properties of this new family of transition metal, you know, atomically thin, monolayered transition metal type halogenized uh, semiconductors. So that that's going to be the subject of, of the talk today. So the title of the talk is Electrons, Holes, and Excitons in Monolayer Semiconductors or how we can reveal some of the fundamental properties of these uh, new and exciting materials by doing optical spectroscopy in really big magnetic fields. So again, the subject of uh, today's talk, it's not gonna be a talk about graphene. This is a talk strictly about uh, the TMD or transition metal dichalcogenized semiconductors uh, that I think many of you in the room are very familiar with. These are materials like monolayer MOS2, MOS2, tungsten diselenide, et cetera. As and if you probably know, uh, in their monolayer form, when viewed from above, they have a lot in common with graphene in the sense that it's a hexagonal crystal lattice, uh, nice honeycomb lattice, but because there's different atoms in the unit cell and because the metal atoms, molybdenum and tungsten, are pretty heavy, uh, instead of having nice Dirac cones at the K and the K prime points of the hexagonal Brillouin zone, this opens up a nice, big, healthy, uh, semiconductor band gap. So these are direct gap semiconductors in the monolayer form. Gap is pretty big, one and a half to two electron volts in wavelength space. That's something like infrared uh, uh, to you know, red light. So this is, I have to be a little careful how I say this so I don't uh, annoy my colleagues who work with graphene, but I think it's okay to say that these materials are like graphene, but maybe, you know, perhaps more immediately obviously useful for certain applications in say alpha electronics like photovoltaics or light emitting diodes. Okay. So this is just a very brief outline of the uh, talk. Uh, it'll be a short introduction to these monolayer TMD semiconductors. Again, I know that many, probably most of you in this audience, uh, certainly working here in this facility are familiar with these monolayer semiconductors, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a very quick background in my point of view, you know, why all the recent fuss and attention about these. A couple slides on basic optical properties and optical spectra of uh, these monolayer semiconductors with a focus on excitons and the excited states of, of, or, or Rydberg excitons in these materials. And then spend a lot of time talking about the importance of dielectric screening in these monolayer semiconductors. And this may not sound like the world's most exciting subject, but you know, these are two dimensional materials. They're all surface. It matters a lot what goes on top of or below a two-dimensional semiconductor. And we'll see that this is actually a huge effect. It's not something we can just sweep under the uh, uh, rug. And then finally, uh, uh, revealing some very fundamental parameters like the masses of electrons and holes in these materials, the dielectric constant, and even the free particle band gap. All these fundamental properties can be revealed with uh, optical spectroscopy in very high fields. And if there's time, say a few words about uh, the dynamics of electrons and holes in valley scattering Valley relaxation times. So, <clears throat> as you know, the TMD materials in, encompass a pretty broad range of material compounds. As the name suggests, it's a, a transition metal and two halogen atoms. There's, uh, you know, dozens of materials in this family class. Some are metals, some are semi-metals, some are even superconductors, but we're going to focus today on those that are semiconductors, and that means those that are based on tungsten and uh, molybdenum. Okay. Uh, at least in their bulk form, these are by no means new materials. They've been known for you know, probably hundreds of years. So for example, 
Uh, this is a picture of the naturally occurring mineral molybdenite. Uh, uh, this was actually, uh, uh, this is from a molybdenite mine that is near my hometown in northern New Mexico. Um, it's a naturally occurring crystal. Uh, it's mined on an industrial scale uh, for the molybdenum which they use in the steel making industry. Okay. In their bulk form, these are layered indirect gap semiconductors. So within a unit cell, there's nice covalent bonds between the metal and the, and the calcogen, but between layers, there's only very weak van der Waals uh, bonding. And in their bulk form, these are indirect gap semiconductors. So the, 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 the optical gap is indirect in momentum space. Now, you probably even used these materials if you work with you know, car engines or things like that because, because it's a you know, flaky material, it's, just, it's slippery like graphite, and it's used as a solid lubricant you know, for unsticking you know, piston rings and, and, and things like that. And it's always marketed with some amusing name like you know, Lubro Molly or my, 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 my personal favorite, which I have a very hard time saying without giggling is um, McLube, uh, and you can buy an awful lot of it. Okay, so this is a you know, bulk MOS too. So why all the recent attention? You know, so why, why all the fuss? And you know, the reason is uh, these two papers which were published in 2010 from uh, Fang Wang's group at Berkeley and the Tony Hines group then at Columbia uh, both pointed out that as we exfoliate this material, this is the Scotch tape method, get thinner and thinner layers, in the limit of a single monolayer, it becomes a direct gap semiconductor at the K and the K prime points of the hexagonal green one zone, with again a nice big band gap uh, in, in the optical region. Uh, this is just a, a picture from one of these two papers showing a microscope image of an exfoliated flake, uh, and then, you know, with a thin part here and a slightly thicker part here, and it's only that very thin monolayer part that gives you nice bright photoluminescence. So again, evidence for a direct gap semiconductor. Okay, so this got a lot of us uh, excited about its utility for optical electronics. A second key motivation, as I'm sure many of you have heard, is this notion that these materials have really uh, rejuvenated long-standing interest in this notion of uh, of uh, using the valley pseudospin degree of freedom as maybe a basis for computation. This uh, uh, a valley degree of freedom. The key point here is that in their monolayer form, these materials lack a center of crystal inversion symmetry. And together with the strong spin orbit coupling from the heavy metal atoms, leads to this phenomenon of spin valley locking. And what does that mean? It's that in the valence band, we have the spin up and spin down bands uh, ordered as such in the, in the K valley, up and down, but down and up, the opposite orientation in the K prime valley. And what this leads to is valley specific optical selection rules. So the main point is that in these materials with right and left circularly polarized light, you can couple selectively and exclusively to optical transitions in the K and the K prime valley, very easily just with circularly polarized light. Okay, many semiconductors, of course, have uh, you know, you know, different valleys, silicon being the most famous example, but in most conventional semiconductors, it's very difficult to access particular valleys. Right. But here in these materials, you can do it very easily just with circularly polarized light. Okay. And the third motivation, uh, again, as I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, is this notion of you can use these 2D materials to assemble van der Waals heterostructures. So that's just the idea that in a grad student with steady hands, you can assemble you know, her own or his own designer optoelectronic electronic or maybe a spin or valleytronic device just by van der Waals stacking and assembly of these exfoliated uh, model years. And there's you know hundreds if not thousands of devices of this type that have been you now demonstrated uh, to date, probably being made as we speak in this very building. There's a lot of things, however, we don't yet know or haven't been experimentally measured about devices of this type, but are really going to be essential ingredients or, or, uh, for any future rational design of you know, real quantum devices based on these 2D materials. For example, what is the role of dielectric screening? As I'll show, it really matters a lot what goes above and below any one of these monolayer uh, uh, semiconductors. It has a huge impact <laughs> on, on the free particle gap and on the binding energies of uh, excitons, for example. Believe it or not, you know, even very fundamental parameters like electron mass, hole mass, exciton mass, certainly, we're still pulling these values from DFT theory. Uh, there's been very few experimental measurements 
of, of these. And even the form of the potential between an electron and a hole is not, does not go as one over R, like in a bulk semiconductor. Uh, it's, it's something very different, and there's really not been many experimental tests of that. Okay, I'll talk about more about that later in the uh, uh, later in the webinar. And finally, of course, if we're really serious about making spin and electronic devices, what we darn well better know what are the relevant time scales for valley relaxation and spin relaxation and, and scattering. So, uh, you know, by uh, remarkable coincidence, this talk will address uh, you know, these, the experiments will address all three of these uh, uh, questions on, on a quantitative basis. So, just a few slides about the basic optical properties and optical spectra of these monolayer excitons. Sorry, these monolayer semiconductors. So, as you know from your first year uh, semiconductor physics class, you know, the fundamental optical excitation <coughs> in any semiconductor uh, is the electron hole pair, the exciton. So, we have a photon coming in. This is the empty conduction band. This is the full valence band of the it's a canonical semiconductor. If that photon has the right energy, we kick an electron up from the valence band into the conduction band, leaving behind a hole. And so the absorption spectrum of a you know, typical semiconductor looks something like this. We have uh, no absorption, no absorption until the photon energy hits the free particle gap, and then we get some absorption. And the onset of this absorption tells you where the free particle gap is. Okay? However, uh, this is a negatively and a positively charged particle. In the semiconductor, and these two things can cool, you know, bind uh, with Coulomb interaction and form a bound state. You know, very much like hydrogen in, in, in free space. But here we have what's called the exciton. Okay? It's, it's a hydrogen-like bound state. Its binding energy. Well, I'll talk about the binding energy in a second. Uh, uh, that exciton can be seen typically in optical spectra as a discrete absorption peak that lives slightly below the free particle gap. By the binding energy. Typical energy scales in conventional semiconductors like gallium arsenide. So uh, it's the Rydberg scale by the uh, dielectric constant squared and uh, normalized by the mass. In a conventional bulk semiconductor like gallium arsenide, these binding energies are pretty small, They're only a couple of milli electron volts, five millivolts for, for the case of gallium arsenide. And correspondingly, the you know, physical size of this bound electron volt pair is pretty big. So. 10 nanometers or so. Um, oh, one last thing. In very clean material, uh, not only can this electron hole pair you know, bind together in, in a ground state, but in analogy with hydrogen, you can also have excited states of this uh, exciton. So we can have a 2s state or a 3s state or a 4s state, a Rydberg ladder of exciton states. And these Rydberg states live, again, below the gap here, you can sometimes see them as discrete peaks in very clean material, and they would terminate at the free particle gap. Okay? In stark contrast to conventional semiconductors, in these 2D monolayer semiconductors, these exciton states are very small and they're very, very tightly bound. So the fundamental parameters, the binding energies of an exciton in a monolayer semiconductor is huge. It's hundreds of milli electron volts. Again, contrast that with the case in conventional semiconductor like gallium arsenide, where it was only five milli electron volts. This is a hundred times bigger. And correspondingly, the size of these things is pretty tiny. It's like a nanometer or so. You can understand that or at least rationalize it in the following way. If you think about what's really going on, we have a 2D sheet of material, but the electric field lines collect, rather connecting the electron in the hole live mostly outside the material, you know, out in the vacuum. It's a suspended membrane. So it's mostly an unscreened potential. Again, just think about the freshman physics problem of a positive and a negative charge of bringing them together from infinity, integrating up the energy. These electric field lines are mostly unscreened, so it's a big binding energy. But uh, excitons are small, but you know, they, they still occupy you know, a couple, few dozen uh, uh, unit cells. So we can still consider them to be one the amot type excitons, and the effective mass approximation is still okay. Uh, so, as I alluded to earlier, there's an analogy uh, with hydrogen-like states in that this exciton can actually have not only a 1s brown state, but also you know, a 2p excited state, 2s state, 3s state, so on and so forth. So, this uh, just shows the, the band structure in slightly more detail, where here I've drawn the conduction bands and the valence bands in both the k, the red k, and the blue k prime valley. Um, in these materials, there's very, very strong light matter Coupling. Okay, 
So an absorption spectrum typically shows two very strong features associated with the A and the B excitons. Those are transitions from the upper valence band to the conduction band, that's the A exciton, or the lower valence band to the conduction band, that's the higher energy B exciton. A single monolayer can absorb something like 20% or more of the incoming light. That's a remarkable number, right? just, from, just, just from a single atomic layer. In fact, all of the oscillator strength in this material is essentially sucked up by these exciton peaks, and there's really no indication of a free particle gap anywhere. Okay? And this is, uh, we'll actually come back to haunt us in about two slides, so please remember this. Right? So really no indication of a free particle gap. All the oscillator strength is in the uh, exciton peaks. Initially, you know, back in the early days, meaning 2012 or whatever, uh, these materials exhibited pretty large inhomogeneous broadening, but nowadays with encapsulation and things like that, we get much more narrow line bits. And I'll show and examples so, of that. Yes. So what was the primary source of the inhomogeneous broadening? Uh, the primary source of the inhomogeneous <laughs> broadening uh, at least in the early grown exfoliated and CBD grown is probably due to uh, uh, chalcogen defects and vacancies and um, interaction with the substrate, which is typically SiO2. It's just, you know, charge uh, uh, interactions there. That's my understanding. Okay, so let's talk about dielectric screening. <coughs> now, <coughs> You know, since the very early days of this field, there's always been an expectation that because it's a two-dimensional system, there should be an extreme sensitivity to the dielectric environment. That is to say, you know, if we consider a bound electron hole pair in a suspended 2D membrane with vacuum above and vacuum below, we have a nice tightly bound system. But uh, again, now imagine the freshman physics problem where we take dielectric slabs and put it on top of and below this 2D system. Now the electric field lines are screened by whatever material went above and below. What do we expect to happen? Okay. Well, we expect that the physical size of this, you know, screening will occur and the physical size of this exciton complex will increase and its binding energy will decrease by a lot. You know, we expect this to be a pretty dramatic effect, probably hundreds of millivolts effect, but how can we measure this? Okay, so that's the experimental goal here. How can you measure this? So you say, ah, you know, this should, you know, this, this should be easy. That, that guy from Los Alamos said that all we have to do is, you know, measure the free particle gap and measure, you know, where that exciton transition is. And then this energy difference here gives me the binding energy. Right? Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't work because, as I mentioned two slides ago, in these materials, there's really no clear optical signature of where the free particle gap is. All the oscillator strength got uh, uh, sucked up by these exciton transitions. Okay, so that simple approach doesn't work. <clears throat> so you say, all right, well, you know, I learned in physics or maybe philosophy, everything's relative, right? So who cares where this free, free particle gap is? I'm just going to measure the energy of this exciton transition and then see how this changes as I vary the dielectric environment, and that should be good enough, right? Unfortunately, that also doesn't work particularly well. And it turns out that <clears throat> The energy of this exciton state is largely unaffected, believe it or not, by the surrounding dielectric environment. And the reason for that is because any reduction in the binding energy is almost exactly compensated by a corresponding reduction in the free particle gap. So uh, I realize now for this webinar, I should have had an animation. Um, uh, but for the moment here, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just use my hands and tell you where they are. So imagine you know, the ground state is the floor. Here's the free particle gap up at my, the top of my head here. And here's the exciton energy you know, down here at my chin. So this would be the binding energy, right? Any reduction in the binding energy because I put dielectrics around it is compensated by a corresponding reduction in the free particle gap. So the energy of that exciton is still here at my chin. It doesn't change very much. So even though it's the easiest thing to measure, unfortunately, it's not a particularly good indicator of what's going on with the dielectric environment. We need some other measurable that couples directly to either the size or the binding energy itself. Yes, that's a question. I'm trying to do the thing in my head, and I don't immediately <coughs> obvious why it compensates almost exactly. Uh, it's because it's the same Hartree term. It's the same self-energy term uh, that, that, that enters uh, okay. in, into uh, the, the, the uh, equations when you put dielectrics around it. It's, oh, it's, okay. it's, it's basically a self-energy Hartree term. 
And this has been verified both experimentally and certainly theoretically many, many times. Okay. I, was, I was very surprised to learn this, um, but it is absolutely 100% true. So it's not an especially, it hasn't stopped people from trying, but it's not an especially good way of uh, saying anything quantitative about the dielectric environment, it turns out. So we need some other measurable. Um, you know, one possible approach, if you're lucky enough to have really clean systems where you can actually see this Rydberg ladder of, you know, excited Rydberg states, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, you can kind of guesstimate what a three particle gap might be, but that, you know, you have to be really lucky and have a very clean system. Okay. Um, our approach has, has been to use a very high magnetic field to address this physics question. Okay. So what we're going to do is use the diamagnetic shift, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, use the diamagnetic shift as a direct probe of the exciton size. And again, size was one of those two things that should be directly impacted by the dielectric surroundings. So what's the diamagnetic shift? Um, again, if you think back to the first time you had to solve Schrodinger's equation for two particles, electron and a hole. So you do P squared over 2M for electron, P squared over 2M for a hole. You put everything in reduced mass coordinates and uh, relative distance, and you add a magnetic field. The lowest order correction to the energy of that complex, you get the same thing if you're solving the hydrogen atom, is the diamagnetic shift. It's a quadratic increase in the energy uh, with mm -hmm. magnetic field, and it depends only on the actual physical size of that exciton complex and the mass and, and, and the reduced mass. So this is great because now we have a way to probe the size okay, using uh, a magnetic fields. Now these effects are not particularly large uh, uh, and you really win if you use uh, high magnetic fields because it enters quadratically. Uh, so this is a picture of a 65 Tesla Pulse magnet, pulse magnet that we uh, routinely use at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Just to give you some sense of scale, um, you know, it's maybe 20 centimeters in diameter, and maybe half a meter tall or so. It weighs about, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 pounds or so. Uh, it's powered by a capacitor bank that looks exactly nothing like that. Um, but the, the, the basic idea is that all you have to do is put about 35,000 amperes across these leads and you'll get very, very large magnetic fields, you know, 50, 60, 70 Tesla for a few tens of milliseconds, during which time we're going to take very high resolution optical spectra and back out this uh, diamagnetic ship. Um, so at this point, you know, you might be thinking, all right, it, it sounds pretty exciting, but is, is it really necessary to use such you know, enormous magnetic fields to address this physics question? And I will argue that, uh, particularly for the case of monolayer semiconductors, the answer is emphatically yes, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that in these materials, the masses of electrons and holes are thought to be pretty large, something like half of their electron mass. That means that the corresponding magnetic energy, or, or, or the cyclotron energy, EV over MC, is pretty small in these semiconductors. You know, it's only like uh, 300 microvolts per Tesla. In addition, as we've been discussing, these materials have you know, gigantic exciton binding energies, hundreds of milli electron volts. So whereas in conventional semiconductors like gallium arsenide, where you know, 10 or 20 Tesla was more than enough to take you clear into the high field limit where the cyclotron energy was the biggest energy in the problem, much bigger than any binding energy, here in these monolayer semiconductors, 100 Tesla is still very much in the weak field limit <laughs> in the sense that even at 100 Tesla, cyclotron energy is only 30 millivolts, which is an order of magnitude less you know, than, than, than the binding energy. So what we really need is something like 1,000 Tesla, but we don't have that. But we, you know, you'd be surprised what we can do in fields up to uh, 100 Tesla. Okay? So our first experimental studies um, of these uh, systems uh, were used uh, large area DMD monolayers grown by chemical vapor uh, deposition by Kathy McCreary at the Naval Research Lab. The reason we like to use large area samples is because you know, any vibrations that always occur in these pulse field measurements, uh, we'd be in insensitive to them because we're studying a large area sample. Um, so here's a, just a picture of, 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 this is for the experimentalists in the audience. This is a picture of uh, one of our pulse magnets, it was a helium cryostat. The experiment was quite simple. We took white light, 
uh, from a xenon lamp, pass it through a fiber, polarize it, right, and left strictly polarize, bounce it off the sample, and measure the reflection uh, spectrum. Okay. So, ah, um, I left this slide in from a tutorial that I gave a, a few months ago. I think it's kind of fun if you've never thought about these sorts of things. Uh, this is a, a brief experimental aside about powering pulse magnets. So the question to you is, uh, does anybody have any idea how much energy is actually required to generate magnetic fields of this scale? In other words, you know, magnets about this big, if we integrate up, you know, B squared dB over all space, how much energy are we talking about? Is it, you know, is it a joule? Is it a thousand joules? Is it a bazillion joules? Is, you know, is, does anybody have any guess or any idea? I had no idea when I started this business. It was all good pair. A terajoule. No. Um, no. It's not a terajoule. The answer turns out to be uh, something like <coughs> a megajoule. A megajoule. Okay. okay. Great. A megajoule. Uh, how much is that really? I don't really have any physical intuition for how much is a megajoule. So here's a multiple choice uh, quiz uh, part mm -hmm. of the talk. Is a megajoule, this is just a show of hands, is a megajoule a stick of dynamite? Or maybe the energy in a candy bar, or maybe the change in potential energy if you ride your bicycle up this most famous mountain in the Tour de France, you know, the Alpe d'Huez, which is something like uh, almost a 4,000 foot climb, or none or all. So stick a dynamite, anybody? Don't be shy. Yeah, one taker. Candy bar, oh, you're all. No? <laughs> all of them? None of them? Okay, it's, the answer turns out to be all of the above. All of each, each of these is about a million joules of energy. It's about a million joules in a stick of dynamite. Candy bar is what, 250 calories? Those are big calories, right? So 250,000 times four joules. Per, yeah, it's about a million joules. Uh, turns out if you ride your bike up that mountain, it's about a million joules, you know, for a guy my size wearing my clothes. So I'm going to ride up all the way that mountain to eat a Snickers bar, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> so the question that was just asked is more of a sports physiology yeah. question. Turns out your body is only about 25% efficient. So I might change my potential energy by a million joules, but you need to do 4 million joules of work to do that. So you can eat more of those. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the problem with pulse magnets is that when things go wrong, they happen on this sort of time scale, okay? not this sort of time scale. And you know things do go wrong with uh, an energy scale <laughs> of, of this type. So this is a bad day at work. Uh, this, this, this is a picture of one of our pulse magnets that uh, failed, and uh, it blew the Christ at the smithereens. Hopefully the sample survived. Uh, but you know we have extra magnets on the shelf. We just put it in, and we're back up and running after a, a, a couple of hours or so. So anyway, back to the data. Um, this is the first experimental data that we took of, uh, in pulse magnetic fields. This is the reflection spectrum. Uh, as a function of photon energy. In this case, we're looking at uh, CVD ground monolayer WS2. And you can very clearly see strong resonance from the A exciton and at higher energy the B exciton transition. This is showing reflected light in a right circuit polarized and left circuit polarized uh, as a function of field up to 65 tesla. You can very obviously and clearly see there's a you know, nice splitting between these two peaks. So our experimental task is now uh, going to be to fit these very carefully and see how the energies change. And so this is uh, 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 the, the energies of the right and left circuit polarized transitions. These are corresponding to transitions in the K and the K prime <laughs> valley, respectively. There's you know an obvious splitting and some interesting valley Zeeman effects. But uh, what I really want to talk about today is not the splitting, but rather what's the average energy. So if you've got good eyes and you're sitting up front, you can probably notice that these lines are not perfectly straight. They both have a slight upward curvature. So the average energy is our guide magnetic shift. It is perfectly quadratic, even up to the highest magnetic fields that we attained in this experiment. And this, this curvature, this quadratic curvature, gives us the size, which is what we're after. Okay. We still have to, uh, at this point, take a mass from DFT theory, but we assume a mass that independent of anything else, we get the size. So for this particular sample, we can back out, all right, that exciton was 1.53 nanometers in, in, in radius, and then with a bit of math and modeling, we can say this binding energy was this, this big number, 400 millivolts or so. Okay, so what? Big deal, right? I mean, so why is this important? Well, now we have a handle on 
that one parameter that should be particularly sensitive to the dielectric environment. And that's the size of the exciton. So the next step should be uh, 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 pretty clear. Now we're going to take monolayers and vary the dielectric environment above and below and see how these excitons change and see how the bonding energy changes. So at this point, we got a little uh, wiser about how to do these measurements. And Nathan Wilson is a, a graduate student working in a group with my collaborator, Xiaodong Shu, at the University of Washington. And what Nathan was able to do is uh, 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 quite uh, clever. Um, we're now working with exfoliated flakes, just because in general, I think this is still true to date, although I hope somebody will tell me I'm wrong. I believe that to date, exfoliated uh, materials are still have higher optical quality than CBD grown materials. So Nathan was exfoliating single monolayers and building little header structures directly over the core of the single mode optical fiber. And the reason we did that uh, is, so, is, is for reasons of mechanical stability so that there's no drifts or vibrations or change in the optical path with respect to the sample in the course of these experiments. So in these pulse field measurements, things shake a little bit uh, uh, and drifts and vibrations are really a killer. So this is the approach that we adopted. Okay, so we have a little header structure um, uh, directly over the core of the fiber. Once you make this thing, it's very robust. You can swing it around, and you, just, you just throw it in the magnet and then measure uh, the uh, transmitted light. Um, okay, I think everybody's familiar with this. Uh, what Nathan did was you know, use a stamp method, so he exfoliated monolayers, assembled the header structure, and then we placed it and positioned it directly over the core of a fiber. You know, real life is never quite as pretty. Uh, this is an actual photograph of the structure, this this uh, white dot right here is the core. It's about three or four microns in diameter. This yellow bit here is the exfoliated monolayer. This blue stuff here, in this case, is hexagonal boron nitride that we use to encapsulate this particular sample. Again, uh, this is uh, now optical transmission data as a function of energy. Um, there should be a magnetic field scale here, but we have narrower lines in this case. and. <coughs> Let me just show everything. Um, essentially what we're doing is measuring these diamagnetic shifts now in different dielectric environments. I think it makes most sense to start from your right, uh, working left. So on the extreme right, we have the least screen case where we have the single monolayer that's just sitting on top of the glass fiber and nothing above. And in this case, we see a very small diamagnetic shift indicating very tightly bound exciton. Okay? As we now put stuff above and below, so for the case of we put some polymer on top, the middle panel here, we see a larger diamagnetic shift, bigger exciton, and in the most screened case where we have a high K dielectric, boron nitride, both below and above this monolayer, you see a nice big large diamagnetic shift indicating a big large exciton. Okay? So the you know the essential point is that yes, indeed, the size of that exciton does depend systematically on the dielectric environment. And the main message here is that if we now can compute the binding energy, this is what we're really after as a function of the dielectric environment, it's a huge effect. Okay, as expected, uh, it's a hundreds of millivolts change in the binding energy as we go from unscreened to you know, reasonably well screened with you know, some sort of high K dielectric like uh, uh, boron nitride. We still at this point have to assume some mass, but you know, independent of whatever mass you assume, you know, these binding energies are changing by hundreds of millivolts. This is not some second order effect that we can just ignore. But this is definitely going to happen anytime we're making some van der Waals header structures. It's something you will need to worry about if you're making an optical electronic device. So the main message is that if we're going to integrate 2D semiconductors in a real quantum device, that dielectric environment does play an unavoidable and very significant Role. There's the hundreds of millivolts variation in the band gap and the binding energy. So I want to emphasize this word band gap here because what's really happening, right? We can use this, uh, uh, you know, this is sort of a glass is half full uh, sort of situation. We can now imagine doing some very clever sorts of Coulomb engineering mm -hmm. of a monolayer semiconductor simply by putting dielectrics nearby. So what I've shown, what I've drawn here is just, you know, the ground state exciton energy and the free particle gap of a monolayer semiconductor. If we can imagine placing or patterning dielectrics on top of this monolayer semiconductor, what's really happening? Again, I argued that the 
exciton energy isn't changing, but the binding energy is. So what's really being modulated is that three particle band gap. One of these reasons of, uh, of, of self energy and, and, and the Hartree curve uh, that comes about when you have nearby dielectrics. What's really happening is you're modulating that three particle gap. Yes, sir. You know, there is one other complication as well, which I'm probably going to have looked into it. In addition to the A and B exciton, there is also a low energy exciton. Some people say it's a trion, and we have done some experiments to show that it could be an evenly bound exciton. Mm -hmm. That really very sensitive to the dielectric. Right. So, as a result, in addition to what is happening here, the bandage, even far away from the bandage, you have significant effect depending on the dielectric screen. Mm -hmm. is, is, should that be taken into account when you are looking at this picture? So, uh, so the question was about uh, charge exciton features and trials, right? And these are additional bounce states that typically appear, you know, maybe 30 millivolts below the a uh, 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 neutral 1s exciton down here. Uh, in our experiments, we were intentionally dealing with charge neutral materials. So we're, in, you know, we're, 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 we're trying not to look at those types of effects. Uh, let me for the moment say only that one also gets very interesting screening effects when you electron to hold dope this material, which is a situation that would lead to the formation of charge exotons. So the presence, or absence of free carriers with electrons or holes will also have similar screening effects. Yeah. Yes, but really it depends upon the, the dynamics in terms of the rate of transition between the different, uh, mm -hmm. because if you excite electrons on the holes and then you know how they would be combined, it's going to be determined by the relative uh, radiated transition probabilities between those three exotonic states. Yeah, but for, uh, for an absorption density of states, it doesn't depend too much. You know, maybe the line width, that maybe the line width did, did depend on lifetimes, but the, but the relative positions, you know, in our studies, because we have looked at dope systems, it's not a huge effect. Turns out, I can I can say more about that maybe after the talk. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Anyway, so what's really happening here is you know simply by placing dielectrics nearby you can actually affect a rather significant hundreds of millivolts modulation of the uh, free particle gap in these materials. So you don't need an electrostatic gate or anything. Just put some other material on top of or, or, or below, and you can actually have a lateral modulation. Um, there's been some experiments uh, along these lines. This is data from uh, a paper from the group of Tony Hines, where they uh, have a region of this, I think it's tungsten disulfide, where they place two layers of graphene above. And they have a way of inferring what the free particle gap is by looking at uh, the Rydberg state. And what they showed is that indeed below this region of the monolayer semiconductor where this graphene sits, there's a you know, pretty big, very abrupt modulation of, of that free particle gap. So I think in the you know, coming years, the next five years or so, we'll see a lot of very clever and interesting uh, games being played with this idea of you know, Coulomb engineering a monolayer semiconductor just by Know, some sort of rational placement of nearby dielectric. So in this uh, last part, I'm going to talk about also using these very high magnetic fields to reveal some of the very fundamental parameters of these monolayer semiconductors that have not actually yet been experimentally measured. So as I mentioned, you know, electron masses, hole masses, certainly exciton masses, we're still taking these values from DFT theory, right? They haven't been experimentally measured. We're starting to get experimental measurements of electrons and whole mass from temperature dependent transport uh, uh, studies. But exciton mass is uh, uh, not something that's been experimentally measured. Again, as I said, this electrostatic potential between an electron and a hole does not go as one over R, it goes as something else, and we determine what that something else is. And even the screening parameters of a single monolayer, again, these are values we're taking mostly from DFT theory. Now, all of these material parameters can actually be experimentally measured by spectroscopy of excited Rydberg states of these excitons in a high magnetic field. So first, let's talk about this uh, funny potential that exists in a 2D material. Okay? It is definitely not uh, hydrogen-like. It does not go as one over R. You can see that in the following way. Again, this is just first-year physics problem. Imagine I have a, you know, a 2D semiconductor, and there's dielectrics above and below. <coughs> 
if this electron hole are very far apart, most of these field lines are in the surrounding blue material here. But as they get closer and closer and closer together, more and more of these field lines actually lie in the 2D semiconductor itself. So it's like the dielectric quote unquote constant is changing the separation. That means that the potential does not scale as one over R. In fact, this very interesting physics problem was uh, uh, worked out by uh, Kelvish himself uh, back in 1979. Uh, who, he, he considered a dielectric slab surrounded by semi-infinite slabs of some other dielectric and uh, he, you know, backed out a potential of the following slightly funny looking form. And I used to call this the Kelvis potential, but then I was uh, scolded by a Russian theorist who, who reminded me that in fact this same problem had been worked out a dozen years earlier by Ritova in her PhD thesis. So I'm now calling this the ritova Kelvis potential, and I guess you should too. Um, so it has this kind of funny combination of special functions, but you know, it's really a well-behaved potential. This is the uh, diagram of the potential is the energy on the y-axis versus you know, particle separation on the x-axis. At large separations it goes as one over r, scaled by this kappa surrounding dielectric, as you might expect. Looks like a bulk semiconductor, but then as small separations, <coughs> instead of screaming off towards negative infinity, like one over r does, it diverges much more gently to something like log r. And the only scaling parameter is this uh, parameter R0, which is the screening length of the 2D material itself. Okay. Now, you can imagine, again, just from elementary physics, that if we mess around with the shape of this potential, that's going to completely change this, the uh, Rydberg spectrum. Okay. If I start monkeying around with the shape of this potential, the positions of the 1s, 2s, and 3s excitons are going to change completely. Conversely, uh, if we can measure the energies, of these excitons, we can then say something quantitative about the shape of this potential itself, right? And decide, does this ritova kelvis potential really do an accurate job of describing what happens in real life in a real 2D material? So that's the physics goal here. So that brings us to Rydberg excitons. Um, they've been the subject of a lot of investigation the last couple of years. Uh, Rydberg excitons are important because this Rydberg series, you know, if you can measure the two, three, four, five S Exitons that tells us about this non hydrogenic potential um, for reasons I just described. Also, it should be you know, very clear that if we can measure enough of these Rydberg states, then we sort of get the free particle you know, gap for free. Uh, and then, with the addition of a magnetic field, as I'll show in the next slide or, or, or two, we can uh, uh, back out the carrier mass independent of any model. Okay. You know, all of this depends on being able to properly identify these different Rydberg states. So this is early work from the group of Tony Hines where they saw these extra wiggles. And uh, you know, you, I, I think ultimately he was correct, but you know, at the time you better be right that this wiggle is the 2S and that wiggle is 3S and so on and so forth, and that they're here and not quite here. Uh, in fact, when people first started encapsulating these monolayer semiconductors in boron nitride, and they saw these higher energy peaks, some groups assigned them to Rydberg excitons, and some groups assigned them to uh, Raman resonances. So, you know, one of the many beautiful things about high magnetic fields is that they can uniquely identify different Rydberg states. In the following sense, each Rydberg state has a very distinct diamagnetic shift. So this is a calculation now um, of the energy of the ground state, the 2s excited state, 3 and the 4s excited states uh, of an exciton as, as a function of magnetic field. You can just see that they have completely different Dispersions, of course. There's two regimes that I want that are worth talking about. Uh, one is the weak field regime, where the magnetic field is small, cyclotron energy is much less than the binding energy. In fact, we already talked about this case. Uh, in this regime, we get quadratic dependence of the energy with magnetic field. Again, it's not a subtle effect. You know, the, the curvature of this 2s state is tens of times larger than that of the 1s state. Um, and even more importantly, in the other regime of strong magnetic fields, where now the cyclotron energy is much, much bigger than any binding energy. Okay? Well, we, again, we know what happens in this regime. We get optical transitions between the linearly dispersing lambda level in the conduction band and, and the valence band. So the expectation is that in sufficiently high magnetic fields, these dispersions will tend towards linear, 
and the slopes and the separations between these linearly dispersing levels will essentially give us the cyclotron energy and therefore the mass independent of everything, okay? No model necessary. So the goal here, the physics, the experimental goal here is to measure the cleanest samples where we see the, you know, most highly excited rid root states in the highest magnetic field possible. So uh, again, that's what we uh, attempted to do. Uh, Nathan at the University of Washington uh, made us a, a nice set of samples, again, assembled on top of the cores of optical fibers, uh, single exfoliated monolayers encapsulated by boron nitride, um, very clean optical spectra, nice narrow line widths. Uh, this is uh, raw experimental data for the experimentalists in, in, in the audience, just to give you some idea of the signal to noise see a clear 1s ground state, maybe this is a 2s state, I'm not sure, there's some other funny business going on at uh, very high magnetic fields. Um, maybe the best way to look at this data is to view it on a waterfall plot, or it's rather a, a, a surface plot. So um, this is transmission as a function of photon energy on the x-axis, and magnetic field here on the y-axis for both right and left circular polarizations. Okay, so dark lines mean absorption. So uh, this is now the uh, art appreciation part of the talk, where you can look at this and you say, well, how many lines are there? Okay. And certainly I hope that everybody sees this one. <laughs> this, this is the 1s ground state. You know, this is 2s state. How, how many more? What do you let me get away with? Anybody see three? I can see, I can see four. Three, four, four. Five. Who said five? Two oh. plus three. You're higher. Two right. plus three. Okay. Plus two. <laughs> okay. So we thought we could reasonably claim that there are four lines here. All right. And as I'll show on the next slide, these are indeed the ground state and the two, three, and the four S cited Rydberg states of excitons. In this case, this is a tungsten dicellonite. So we can plot the energies of these states. There's some interesting Dali Zeman effects that. Um, I, I won't dwell on, what I want to focus on is now these uh, diamagnetic shifts. So it's the average energy of the right and the left, right, these lower peaks. And these are the quadratic, or sorry, these are the uh, um, diamagnetic shifts for the ground state, the 1s state, and the 2s state, perfectly quadratic, even up to 65 Tesla. These exciton states are still in the weak field regime, right? But you can see for the 3S state, it sort of starts out quadratic, but then it kind of leans away and becomes more linear, right? At the very highest magnetic fields. For the 4S state, it's somewhere in between, certainly tending towards linear. Uh, from these curvatures, we can back out the physical size of these excitons and say something about the shape of the wave function. Um, what we find is rather surprisingly good agreement with this Rotoba Keldus potential, not just in the energies themselves, but also in the diamagnetic shift, which is a measure of the spatial extent of that wave function. Okay, so we can say, you know, and, and, and it agrees not, you know, just approximately, but within, you know, sort of 10%, which I consider pretty remarkable. So the punchline here would be, yes, indeed, this rotova keldus potential does seem to do a pretty accurate job of describing the electrostatic potential between an electron and a hole in a 2D material surrounded by dielectrics. Most importantly, at least for me, is that at the highest fields, looking at the most weakly bound excitons, we still have to do a bit of modeling, but we can now back out the mass okay, for, for the first time. And the mass that we back out for the case of tungsten diselenide is about 0 0.2. This is, this is a reduced mass, by the way. It's about 0 0.2. All right? This is maybe 10% heavier than what DFT theory was predicting, which is about 0 0.18. You know, being an experimentalist, I would say that, well, of course, then the theory needs to be a little more attention. Um, <laughs> But, you know, fast forward a year or so, we got better and better at, at doing this, and we've essentially done these sorts of measurements with every member of this monolayer TMD family, okay, to extract these fundamental parameters that you're really going to need if you want to design real header structures. So tungsten disulfide, MOS2, MOSE2, MOTE2, uh, for some of these molybdenum compounds where the masses are particularly heavy, we had to go to really high magnetic fields, you know, fields in excess of 90 tesla. Uh, to really you know, push out um, these energies to the point where we could see them and measure their, their shifts. In that case, we had to use a different magnet. This is our flagship 100 Tesla uh, multi-shot magnet. You know, physically, it's much larger, you know, about two meters tall. Um, and for a magnet of this size and scale, 
uh, we can't power it with capacitors, but we do power it with this um, rather enormous uh, 1.4 gigawatt generator that for historical reasons exists at Los Alamos National Lab. And this is a sense of scale visit. You know, one of our technicians here and no, that's not the shortest technician in our laboratory. <laughs> so, um, so here's the punchline. Okay, we've experimentally measured, you know, these parameters, which I think are going to be useful for designing, you know, optical electronic devices. So exciton masses, dielectric screening lengths, free particle gaps, binding energies, etc. For every member of the TMD family that we had access to. So here's a recipe book uh, that we hope will be useful uh, in, in, in the future. One interesting physics problem or question is that for the molybdenum based monolayers, we consistently measured, you know, much heavier reduced masses than DFT theory predicted by about 20 or 30%. 20 or 30% doesn't sound like much, but again, these are reduced masses. So it's, you know, it's the inverse sum of the electron mass and, and the whole mass. Well, whole masses have been pretty well experimentally characterized by ARCAs types of measurements. So those are pretty nailed down. So a 30% difference in a reduced mass implies a significantly heavier electron mass, almost by a factor of two. All right, so we're inferring electron masses of something like 0.7 or 0.8. This is a much bigger than a 0.5 or so that's predicted by DFT theory. And this may seem kind of surprising, right? How, how could DFT be so uh, uh, different? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but it is, our, our measurements are actually consistent with two very recent transport studies uh, of molybdenum based MOS2 and MOSE2, where they've done temperature dependent Shubnikov to Haas measurements and also backed up surprisingly and similarly heavy electron mass. So, this I think is a big outstanding question. If I had to guess, um, probably there's some aspect of electron phonon coupling that is not incorporated into existing DFT models. That's just a guess. So, I mean, I mean uh, so typically very heavy masses and other systems that you know arise from or you know strong correlations, things like that. So that's unlikely to be the case. Uh, that, uh, so, so the question was in many other material systems, heavy masses arise from electron electron correlations, say in heavy fermion systems, for um, I for you know a simple band picture like this. I think it's unlikely. It's not like the uh, itinerant electrons are interacting with some you know, localized F electron band or something that would occur in, say, a heavy fermion material. My personal guess is that uh, there's a much stronger electron phonon, you know, uh, Holstein type Fulleron picture that might be at play here that is not currently captured by existing theory. But I'm, that's pure speculation on my part. So, uh, okay, so I'm out of time here, so I'm going to skip this last couple of slides on electron and whole valley dynamics, except just to get to the, the, the one punchline, which was in a separate set of measurements. Here we go. Uh, we tried to address the following question, which is what is the valley scattering time of electrons and holes in these monolayer semiconductors? You know, I think, you know, me personally, I think this is really a relevant time scale that we need to be worried about if we're serious about making valleytronic materials. How long does it take an electron to scatter between valleys? How long does it take a hole to scatter between valleys? In the case of holes, not only does it have to scatter across the free line zone, it also has to flip its spin. This would be sort of doubly protective. Yeah? So in time resolved measurements, we were able to measure in the same sample with an electrostatic gate, the 100 nanosecond, pretty long relaxation, valley relaxation, of electrons, and then again, in the same sample, when we dope it with holes, much longer, two microsecond decay time uh, for holes to scatter between valleys. Two microseconds is getting interestingly long. Okay, this is long enough to do, you know, maybe real manipulations. And so maybe this notion of valleytronics uh, isn't, you know, actually has some legs and, and, and might actually go somewhere. This is consistent with the expectation that the valence band we have this spin valley locking, this whole degree of freedom, valley uh, uh, degree of freedom is pretty robust. So that's um, the end. Uh, so in summary, we've talked a lot about optoelectronic properties and monolayer TMDs, talked about excitons that are very tightly bound, but these uh, 
Binding energy and the free particle gap, they always depend on the dielectric environment. We can't ignore this problem. It's not a second order effect, it's a huge effect. But maybe, I think in the coming years, we'll see a lot of Coulomb engineering of monolayer TMDs simply by patterning dielectrics on top of these materials. And then finally, if nothing else, I hope I've convinced you that, <clears throat> you know, uh, very high magnetic fields are a really important tool in basic semiconductor physics, particularly for this family of 2D semiconductors. We can quantify the influence of the dielectric environment and also provide fundamental uh, uh, parameters of like masses, screening lengths, free particle gaps, and really test these theoretical models of the electron hole potential in uh, real two dimensional materials. So, with that, uh, let me conclude. Thank you very much for coming and, and for your attention. And then, uh, let me just acknowledge the folks who did a lot of the hard work. Very talented postdocs uh, at the National High Magnetic Field Lab. Some of you may remember Jing Lee. He came here from uh, Penn State University. Um, Nathan Wilson at the University of Washington, and then my collaborators at the University of Toulouse. So thanks. Thanks again. <laughs>
uh, you're you're thinking about maybe transistor type structures where you have electron transport and then there's electrostatic gate and there's a you know, dielectric layer. In that, um, you know, for sure, the presence of that dielectric are going to be important insofar as they modulate the uh, three particle gap. But you know, all these pictures I've been drawing uh, that have been relevant to optoelectronics, where there's an electron and a hole, uh, you know that hole doesn't exist in a you know electron transport device, right? And if we're talking about a transistor or something like that, there's no holes, right? It's, 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 it's just an electron transport device. So we don't have to worry about you know the effects on an exciton itself. But you would have to worry about the influence of the of, of that dielectric and how is it actually modulating the three particle gap and does that have any influence on the on the mobility. I suspect in that case you're going to be a lot more worried about any roughness of that gate material and how that might uh, influence the mobility of the 2D electron layer that's right below it. But I'm but I'm not a electrical transport person, so that's just my guess. Probably other people in the room would give me much more informed answer. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, yeah. So um, when doing your valley lifetime measurements, did you see any trending um, in particular, like going from uh, molybdenum to tungsten, or going from <laughs> You know, lighter um, yeah. atoms to heavier atoms. Okay, so the 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 question, which I'm going to repeat while I try to get there, uh, is: Did these lifetimes change as I look at different materials? And I wish I could answer that because we've only studied uh, uh, tungsten diselenide, and the reason we've only studied tungsten diselenide is because that is the material where we could gate it both electron and hole type. Okay, we're getting better at this, but for something like MOS2, we have a very hard time uh, uh, gating it in the hole regime, and just because of the just because of the material quality issues. So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, my guess, if I had to guess, is you know, as you go from the MOS base to the uh, as you go from molybdenum to tungsten base, you know, you're basically changing this a lot. It's 150 millivolts to 400. To what extent does that influence, you know, the robustness of the spin valley locking? It's probably going to have some effect. We certainly see it at higher temperatures. I'm just guessing. Yeah, thanks. Um, on the picture where you show the magnetic field dependence, <coughs> I mean, one has in two states. Uh, I saw they have some kind of Y shape at the high fields. Is that valley, valley? Week yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think they're talking about this yeah, here. So yeah. yeah, at the bottom. Yeah, there is that what, one guy what, and the Futuya state. What the heck is this? There is, yeah, there is another another one. No, I understand. Yeah. No. Uh, so this, <laughs> someone always asks this question, and it's a great question. And it took us two years to figure out what was going on. At first, we thought, oh, it's just some polarization leakage because our polarizer isn't very good. But if that were true, you'd see it here as well. Yeah, and we don't. Um, we learned um, that, in fact, the polarizer, the circular polarizer we were using at room temperature, you know, worked very well in this wavelength range. But when we cooled it down, it worked very well in this wavelength range. And that edge was really sharp and it was right there. And that's, and that's why we saw this. We've repeated these measurements with a better, more appropriately designed polarizer. This drove us absolutely crazy. So this is like the whole piece of the polarizer itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think this is just a background subtraction issue, issue. I think. Yeah, but that's much more subtle. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. You'll notice that we don't see any of that once we finally got our act together. And, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. We're using the proper up. Maybe one more question, then we'll wrap up the formal portion of the webinar. Um, so since you mentioned that, um, are these measurements done in Kelvin temperature? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I forgot to mention that. Everything's done in 4 Kelvin. So the table you show, like the back down, it's all Kelvin temperature. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So for MOT to the measurement show, um, does it have phase transition? Lower temperature? MOT2? This? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, we did not see any. What, what, Ah, okay. Uh, we've only looked at it at low temperature. We didn't even study it as it was cooling down. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. 
Let's thank uh, Dr. Crooker one more time.